You're listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Being a thought leader is easy. Getting results is hard. This show is for the results leader who lives and dies by their results. Here is your host and chief results leader, Jonathan Rivera. You are listening to another episode of Results Leader. Welcome back, folks. As you know, thought leadership is easy. Results leadership is hard. And that's why we are bringing you the very best results leaders. So today I have a very special guest, Mr. Garrett Biss. He's a retired Marine Corps pilot, and his transition from the military back to reality was full of anxiety, panic attacks, substance abuse disorders that were hard to get over, but he somehow did it. He managed. And now Garrett leverages his experience to serve those in recovery through online training, workshops, and recovery mindset coaching with his Thriving in Your Recovery program. Mr. Garrett Biss, welcome to the show. What is up, my man? How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Brother, I have been excited. I have been excited to talk to you. And uh, we're just going to dive right into the questions. And like I said, they start off easy and then they'll get a little more insightful. And the idea here is how are we getting results for people? And I know that that's one of your specialties is getting results for people. So let's start with the easy one. All right. Toss it up. All right. What book or books have you most given as a gift? What book or books have I most given as a gift? So some of my favorite ones to give out are Jack Canfield's The Success Principles. It's pretty much a Bible for results and achievement and accomplishment in uh, somebody's life. So that's a really good book. It's quite long. It's, I don't know, maybe 400 pages or so. So it takes a bit of work to get through, but there's nothing about achievement, about success, about self-esteem that you'd want to learn that's not covered uh, in that book. So that's a favorite one to give out. And then another one is The Four Agreements. So by Don Miguel Ruiz, much more, it's a much simpler read, very you know fundamental, but uh, that was a book that absolutely transformed my life. Actually, the first time I read it was when I was in uh, Afghanistan in 2013. And as I was going through it, I was like, wow, this is a really profound message and probably something that I need to spend some time really digesting. I, I noticed some information, some philosophical changes that it was really, you know, it really inspired. So I actually spent, I was really trying to reprogram my mind the best I could. So I spent, uh, I, I read it 21 times in a row. So over 21 days in a row, just to just to really kind of absorb it as best as I could. So that's really, that's another favorite of mine. Yeah. Now that you've reminded me, I got to go back and read that one again. It's been a while yeah. since I read it. Cool. So now a, a fun one. What purchase under a hundred dollars has positively impacted your life? So what purchase under a hundred dollars? So, I mean, books always, I mean, if there's a good book that, that can share an idea or a message, then that's certainly been one thing. And then one of you know, somebody I always say is a mentor of mine, though, of course, I never met him personally, but Jim Rohn, I spent a lot of time listening to some Jim Rohn. And he really inspired me to invest in a good journal. So, you know, if you spend 25, 35, 40 bucks on a good journal, I love his idea that, you know, that now it inspires you to make sure that you fill it with things that are worth that investment. So whether that's Today, you could probably, you know, spend 90 bucks on a really nice, you know, beautiful uh, journal. But but I love that idea that if you invest in it and you spend money on it, then it inspires you to fill it with the ideas that are that are worthwhile. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why this guy's on the show. I got a nice journal with a nice folder on it. And I love filling it with, with good things. So, all right. That's the fun stuff. I love the gallery leather one. I think I've been, I've had a, I've got every different color now so I can tell them apart. I got seven or eight of them over on my bookshelf behind the camera. Yeah. But uh, they make a beautiful one. Really, you know, it's, it's got some substance to it. It's got some beautiful pages. It's really nice. It's been Love a favorite it. of mine for, I don't know, seven years. So now a sidebar. You got the nice journal. Do you have a nice pen to go with it or do you use any pen? Well, that's a good question. So I used to use a Mont Blanc pen. Uh, that was kind of my go-to, my favorite. But now I've, I, I've got an, a nice writing pen. You know, I've kind of been a pen dork. So, you know, I try out some different things, but this is kind of more of an everyday. I've really been a fan of these Sharpie pens for a little while. 
just writes really well. It's one of the first gel pens that I've that I've experienced that actually writes well in the last. A lot of the other ones, it's just kind of like like smearing some kind of crayon on your paper. So, you know, I really like these and they're really fine point. But you know, it's that's that'd be an interesting thing to go back and reflect on, like the different instruments that I've used to write over the times. Cause for a long time it was zebra pens when I was had had to write really small in log books and such. The reason I ask is because I've got my bronze tactile turn here. I invested in many years in nice journals, but I only just now got a nice pen. <laughs> so what is that? So I'm going to write this down. So bronze. This one's a bronze tactile turn. I just like the weight of the pen and I like that it's bronze yeah. and I feel like, you know, we're going to battle the bronze age and that's what I'm doing every, every day in the journal. Dorky sidetrack. I'm sorry, but I can't no, help man, myself. I love it. We're right there. <laughs> I'm right there with you. All right. Now, now let's let's get a little bit deeper here. How has an apparent failure set you up for later success? Man, that's a, you know, if you look back over your life, you know, as you're living through life, so many of the experiences, they might feel like failures in the time, but I'm so hard pressed to find some gem or some lesson that, that you didn't, you know, that I didn't learn from something. I mean, where do you like, how give long it. do we got? How many, uh, how many failures do you want to go over? So just give us one profound one or, uh, you know, the one, the first one that comes to mind is usually the best one to share. Yeah. So the biggest, probably the biggest, you know, kind of earth shattering one was my divorce. I mean, that, you know, going into that is absolutely felt like a failure. I think that's what really made it such an emotional, you know, nobody goes into a marriage thinking that they're going to get divorced. So when you have to confront the reality that that's the direction that it's going, it does. It feels like a tremendous failure. And what I realized was, and this, you know, and it really set me up to learn a whole lot about our motivations, about our psychology. But what I realized is of all the different things that are in our life, whether it's our relationships, our profession, our personal development, our health, we tend to, now you would think if you laid all those things out and maybe you scaled yourself in some way and you could see like, hey, I'm really succeeding here, but not so much here. You would think that you would go to that place that you're not succeeding and that you're not experiencing the results and that you would be kind of naturally driven to do some something there to get the you know to get those results to a better place but what i found and what i you know what i've seen in other people is wherever we seem to be succeeding the most that's where we'll invest more time and energy because we love to get good results we love to get good feedback and that was the experience that i faced when i was married i was you know there it, it was no secret that our marriage was not in a great place but I wasn't investing my time and energy there. I kind of took it for granted where I was investing my time and energy was I was pouring more of it into work because I was succeeding at work. I mean, I was getting promotions. I was getting recognition. You know, I had really good working relationships with my Marines. So I was investing a lot more time and energy there because it feels good to, to feel good. It feels good to be recognized. It feels good to have successes. So when we're having that, we'll double down in those areas. We, we may tend to double down in those areas, even though it comes at a cost of other areas in our life. So living through that and in hindsight, it just helped me appreciate the need for having that balanced life and the need to really be honest with yourself about how things are going in different areas of your life and recognize, hey, if I can't ignore this one area for so long, or maybe investing a little bit of time and energy in there. And this is something I do with a lot of my my coaching clients, like, hey, let's do it just a, a, a uh, you know, kind of subjective snapshot of where things are in your life. Now realize if you're want to excel more in all areas of your life, we need to clean up those greatest deficits. We need to work on those areas that you feel like you're succeeding the least or that you feel like you have the most work to do. Because when you do that, even a little bit of energy invested in that will help raise the tide for every other area of your life. So that was been a, that was a huge uh, kind of awakening and realization for me. So did I hear that correctly? Because there's different schools of thoughts on this. And so I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. It sounded like you said that when we're winning, we like to keep winning. So we go to where we naturally win. Boom. Easy. Mm -hmm. But when we're losing, we kind of just shy away from that. And it sounded like you said, sometimes you got to take those spots where you're losing or where you're weak and you have to improve them. Is that what you said? Oh, certainly. So for example, if you're doing well, maybe you're doing well in relationships, you're doing well at work, but your physical health is terrible. Well, of course, we may, you know, it might be hard to change those routines and start investing more time and energy in your physical health or make those changes because it hurts to look at, you know, it, it, it's not fun to look at the, at the crap in our life. It's not fun to look at those places that we're not excelling or not succeeding, but it can be really important to 
make even a little bit of change there, you know, improve your health just a little bit there, focus a little bit of energy there, because what you'll find in quick in quick fashion is that it helps those other areas of your life as well. So here, I'm going to ask you, because I'm on the fence about this particular thing, because the other school of thought is then just dive deep into the areas you're good and fill your life with that. So why why not that approach for you? I think there's, I mean, because we can operate and we can go too far in that extreme. We end up sacrificing so much more in our life if we just bury ourselves into that one area. And every area looks different for somebody, but operating in those extremes is not a healthy place to be because a lot of times we won't realize the sacrifices that we're making in other areas until it's a little too late or until it takes too much effort to dig us out of that. So if you are really excelling at or succeeding in one area of your life, it can blind you to the other things that you might need to address or might need to clean up. And if you, you know, if you're really excelling or succeeding in your professional life and you keep leaning more and more and more into that, then the time, energy, and attention that you could be investing in your personal development, in your relationships, in your family, in your physical health, if you continue to starve those other areas of your attention and your energy, it's not going to have great results. And it will ultimately affect that, you know, whatever that goal area or whatever that success area of your life is. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right. So let's go back to a little bit of fun. What is the most worthwhile investment that you have ever made? Let's see, the most worthwhile investment. I mean, anything that you can invest in yourself, in your personal development, in your growth. I mean, I think sometimes we undervalue the value of a good book or a good audio book because the value that you can get from it is so significantly different than the price that you have to pay for it. There's, you know, kind of one story where I, I was talking about in the, you know, in the Marine Corps. So I'm really excited about, I'm really passionate about working with water. And I say a lot of times in America, we take water for granted because it's so easy to come by and it's so cheap. For example, if you went out to dinner and you sit down and you maybe you order like a $40 steak or a nice piece of fish or some, you know, some nice entree, and you pay $40 for it. And then you tack on an appetizer and some desserts and you look at all this food on the table, you might not realize the value of that glass of water is actually more valuable than all the other food on the table as far as sustaining your life. But because you paid no money for it, because it was just delivered for free, usually without even asking for it, a lot of times we we don't recognize the true value of that. I think the same can be said for books. You know, many books you can get for less than $20, maybe even less than $10, or you can go to a used book sale and pick them up for a dollar. But the information that's in that and the return on investment that you could have from that is probably greater than the return on investment you could have for any other thing that you might spend your money on, except for maybe Google stock back in the 90s. But like the return on investment from the information and the ideas that you can get from a book is tremendous and it's phenomenal. You've got to find the right books and you've got to find the right messages and the right ideas. But if we're not looking for them, we won't get it. And you know, if you go into my house right now, the thing that probably has the greatest value is the library that I have. I mean, you look at everything else around my house and in the change and the impact that it could have on somebody's life, on the ability to transform somebody's life is certainly uh, much more valuable than, than anything else you might see. Yes, sir. So that opens up another question. How do you pick, because you said the value of a good book, how do you pick a good book? That's a great question. Yeah. So I've got this little trend, you know, I love buying books a little bit more than I love reading books. <laughs> so, I mean, with most things and, and decisions that we make in our life, for one, I think that things are brought into our awareness at the time that we need to see it. So if, if I hear about a book or if something about the book draws my attention, then there's probably a reason for that. Otherwise, yeah, that's, I mean, that's probably the number one thing. Like if I feel like it, there's an information in there that I want to uh, experience or that I want to learn, then, uh, then I'll go into that. You know, of course, listening to what other people recommend, if there's people you know, like Jack Canfield maintains a list that he posts publicly of the top 100 books to read. And this is another thing from Jim Rohn in the Mortimer Adler's uh, book, How to Read a Book. There's a list of like 300 like must reads in the back. So, you know, if there's people that are, that are, that, uh, you know, kind of resonate with your philosophy and, and, and you feel like, you know, you learn, you learn a lot from them, then it might be a good idea to go to the source material and read some of the things that they've read and, and learn from, uh, from those. So that can be a great thing. I like it, man. I, uh, I'm with you. I, so quick sidebar, and then we got to keep moving audiobook, physical book, Kindle, which do you prefer? So I've, I've, I've tried all three physical books. I think, you know, I love the most. I can get through books a lot more quickly if I do the audible book. So what I've done, done quite often actually is, well, for one, I've got an audible account and it seems like those credits keep piling up. So sometimes I'll buy a book and I'll just listen to it. But if I'm listening to an audible book, I've, what I love about it is you can, uh, 
you can accelerate the speed of it. So you can listen to it on two times or two and a half times the speed. So sometimes I'll just, I'll do kind of like a cursor review of a book like that. But if it's, you know, if I feel like I'm pausing it or taking notes or, or stopping it a lot, because there's a lot in there, then I'll just go to Amazon. I'll buy the physical copy. That way, when I get it, I can take notes. That's one little thing about me. I, I don't ever lend out books anymore because when I read a book and when I really absorb a book, I end up taking so many notes in the margins and in the back pages that it's no longer a book. Now it's a journal. So now it's not, you know, it'd be much easier for me to just spend $17 and buy somebody if they're interested and I'll just buy them a copy of the book because if I lend it to them and I lose it, which I've done in the past, now I've lost, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars worth of, of knowledge and inspiration and ideas because, you know, I lost everything that came with it. So audible book, I do like that. Sometimes even if I really want to dork out, I'll, I'll listen to the audio book while I'm reading it. So I can kind of flip through the pages and make sure that I'm absorbing it in every possible modality to learning. It's funny. And I mean, we didn't plan this, but I do the same thing. I get an audible, I read it or listen to it. And if I like it, I get the real book. Here, here's what happens when I get the real book. See all the little tabs there. If you're, yeah, nobody can see this. If it's a podcast, but you can see it. I get yeah. it. Then I know what I'm looking for in the book and I start tabbing and highlighting. So I'm with yeah. you on that. I'm, I'm a nerd that way too. And the other cool part, and I don't know if you've done this, but when you do the Audible book and you buy the Kindle book, they sync to each other. So you can go back yeah, and that. forth as as it's going. It's the coolest thing in the yeah. world. Nerdy, nerdy, I've nerdy, I know. <laughs> yeah. And I do like, I mean, I do like Kindle. I mean, the, the fact that you can have like a thousand books in your hand at the same time, that's pretty awesome. And the thing I love about it is being able to search through all of the notes and the highlights that you have. That's uh, incredibly valuable right there. But for all of that, I still prefer to hold a physical book in my hand and, and absorb it in that fashion. But there's certainly a lot of valuable to it. I kind of admire people that can they can do all their reading on a Kindle. I think it's fascinating, especially from that perspective. And you don't know a word, you can click on it and the definition pops up. If you want to highlight something, you can do that. And then anytime in the future, you never need that book in your hand again. You just go in your Kindle account and you can look up all your notes and your highlights. That's, you know, that's tremendously valuable. We could do a whole show on this. I got more nerdy stuff. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole with it. All right. In the last five years, what new belief, habit, or behavior has most improved your life? So belief, habit, or behavior. So I, I mean, a, a fundamental belief change that really drew me into the work that I do now with people that are in addiction recovery is this understanding that I don't believe that the things that we become addicted to, whether it's a substance or a behavior, I don't think that that is in and it of itself the issue. I think that it's a coping mechanism or it's a symptom of something of some deeper issue. And what that's helped me do in my personal journey, in my personal life is do some of the deeper work to figure out why I'm needing that external substance or behavior. And that's really, you know, it's kind of been a guiding uh, belief or a guiding kind of viewpoint or philosophy on, on a lot of the work that I do, whether it's with personal development, self-esteem development, or people that are dealing with, uh, you know, the uh, life after active addiction is trying to find all the ways to internalize the locus of control over our life. So I see a lot of, I see substances and behaviors as an attempt. It's an externalization of controlling some kind of internal emotion or internal feeling or fulfilling some kind of internal need. And anytime we externalize the fulfillment of that need with the, some substance or behavior, there's reasons for it. There's benefits that come from that, but we're handing over the power of ourself and that affects our self-esteem and our sense of self-worth. So what I always you know, what my personal journey into recovery was and what I help walk other people through is how do we internalize that? How do we, how do we develop, how do we build up our self-esteem? How do we take personal responsibility for everything that's in our life? Because in that, in and of itself, just taking personal responsibility for all the outcomes that we experience in our life, that's tremendously empowering. So, you know, some people are like, you know, they, they, they love hiding behind blaming, complaining, and, and trying to externalize the reason why they're having or experiencing a certain result. But when we do that, we're handing over our power to something else. And now we're saying that our life experience is just at the whim of whatever coincidence or circumstances we face. When in reality, if we can internalize that, take that responsibility, then, you know, then that empowers us to experience or to create whatever we want in our life. So I think, you know, that, that belief right there is like that, that, that should be the journey. Like that's the personal development journey. That's the growth experience is trying to internalize the control and the fulfillment of everything that we have in our life. Boy, that is beautiful. I just heard you explain victim mentality and taking back control and power. And that is a beautiful thing, which leads perfectly into our next question. What are 
bad recommendations you hear in your area of expertise? So there's a lot of well-intended advice and, and sage, you know, wisdom or common advice that's out there that it might be true or it might be right or valuable in one specific context, but too often ideas, if they're shared outside of that specific context, they can do more harm than good. One thing that, that hurts a lot of people that are seeking recovery is this thought that if the program is not working for them, that it's their fault, it's not the program. So for example, you know, there's many different pathways to addiction recovery. Uh, there's, you know, the, some of the very common ones that we know socially are AA and NA and, and various 12 step groups. So if somebody buys into this understanding or this belief that the reason that they're not succeeding in recovery, the reason that they keep relapsing, the reason that they keep struggling is solely because it's their fault and it's their problem. Like the AA model or the 12 step model or whatever is perfect. And if you're not experiencing the same results, the positive results as somebody else is, well, then it's got to be your problem because you're not submitting, you're not following it well enough. For some people, that may be true. For some people, they might still be hiding behind some denial about what their situation is, and they might not be willing or, or ready to kind of go to those deep places in our, in our psyche and in our life to do the work that's necessary. But what I think is more true uh, or more often true is that the individual needs to find their best pathway to recovery. Everybody who's struggled with addiction, there's an estimated about 30 million people in America right now that are struggling in active addiction, another 25, 30 million people that are in recovery. For all of those people, they took a different pathway, a different combination of life experiences, circumstances, biological conditioning. They have a different combination of, of factors or variables that got them to that place where they're struggling with that substance or behavior. There's not going to be one pathway that helps everybody out of that situation. There's not going to be a hundred. There's going to be as many individual pathways as there were individual pathways into active addiction. So everybody's journey is going to look different. So that's a bit of a, you know, bad advice that people fall into that can fuel. It only fuels the shame. It only fuels the self doubt. If somebody's telling you that the only reason that you're not successful is because you're not following the system well enough, or you're not submitting well enough. Again, for some people that might be true. They might need that, that kind of reality check. They might need somebody to point out their, you know, their, where they're going wrong. But for a lot of people, it's going to be, Hey, this system, this approach didn't work. Let's go find the right approach for me, for the individual. So, and that, you know, and I guess if you, maybe you feel like you're in that situation, there's a lot of people that are exposed to A and NA or, 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 or any other kind of pathway to recovery. And it just doesn't feel right to them. It just doesn't, you know, in, it resonates in a wrong way. And if you're wondering if that's true for you, then, you know, you really got to be honest with yourself and check in and say, you know, is it, is it just me resisting the change? Is it me just resisting this new belief system, this new thought process, or is there just something fundamentally different about what this system or this approach is offering than, than what I need. And if you're honest with yourself and it's just not a good fit for you, well, that's great. Now you can go and find something that is a right fit or find that, that right pathway because every individual is going to be different. And that's some, really something I bring into the coaching that I do. It's not, you know, as a recovery coach, it's never my decision. It's never my expertise to tell somebody what their recovery should look like. That's always up to the individual. If they, you know, some people, everybody's definition of what that perfect recovery is going to look a little different. It's never my job to define that. And it's never my job to define what somebody's goals should be or what they're, you know, what, what that destination is they're trying to get to. It's solely my responsibility to help them find the strengths, the wisdom, the courage, and everything within themselves to travel that journey by sharing with them any tools or resources or helping them remember tools or resources they've come across in their life. Powerful, powerful. So let's move to the next one. In the last five years, what new realizations have helped you get better results for your clients? What new realizations have helped me get better results for my clients? I mean, I think it really ties into that same thing. The realization that everybody's pathway, everybody's journey is going to be different. There's different things within somebody that have kind of led them to that place. Some work that I've done recently, I spent the last about two years being trained and certified as a RIM practitioner. And RIM is a modality. It's a sometimes thought of as like a psychotherapeutic coaching tool. It's a modality to help people deal with stuck and buried emotions, so emotional memories. And what I've come to learn is that or realize is that everybody, we all operate under a belief system that we have. And the belief system is developed by experiences that we have often in early childhood. They say a lot of the research shows that between four and eight or five and eight years old, we'll experience some things as we're learning 
who we are, what our place is in the world, how the world operates, we'll experience something, come to a conclusion about ourselves or about the world. And then that establishes a belief in us and our belief system is established. And now as we carry ourselves out into the world, we're operating under this belief system. So, you know, brilliantly uh, efficient and effective when it works well, when it doesn't work well, then what happens is you live your life under a bunch of limiting beliefs. You live your life under false beliefs, false beliefs about who you are, about what you're capable of, about what's possible. And through the way that our brain works, the, the belief system that we carry out into the world is it, it becomes our reality because of conscious bias, cognitive bias, perception biases we begin to see and prove to ourselves. And this goes back to that four agreements book, right? Like it, we begin to see and see the things that prove our beliefs, right. And we often discount or don't even see things that don't prove our belief systems, right. So tying this back to the ring work that I've been doing, a lot of the people that struggle with a substance or a behavior to struggle in general in their life, it's because of some emotional pain, some emotional belief that was established from an emotional event that's stuck in their body that for one, they might not, they're, they're most likely not conscious of, and they're certainly not conscious of how it's continuing to affect their life. So RIM is an awesome tool to really kind of laser in on that thing, help that emotional belief or that emotional energy be released from the body so that they can really kind of transform their life. And that's the realization that I've had is that this work and about you know, making fundamental changes or really transformational changes in one's life. It's not the superficial stuff. It's not the, you don't have to have, find a better goal setting technique. You don't have to find the better journal or the better pen. It's about things that are much deeper than what we might think. But the beautiful thing is when you can change those really deep seated things, you know, the, the belief system, the, the operating system, when you can change some of those things, now the difference that you can experience in your life is, is, you know, is fundamentally different. This is where you can make those quantum leaps or those, those just transformational changes in your life. There was a lot there. And, uh, for us parents, uh, there's a lot to, to think about there, especially. Oh, it scares, the, it scares the hell out of me too, because of like me. understanding that and like <laughs> learning about some of the, the really benign and simple little things that happened in my life when I was six, seven, eight years old, that, that really got, you know, that, that set the context for the next 30 years of my life realizing like how benign it's like every like every day i'm like what is my daughter going to experience and how's this going to fundamentally shift her life from an adult's perspective and that's and that's why it can be so that's why it can be so tricky right because from from an adult from our perspective with everything that we know about the world looking back at the situation we might look back at something that happened to us when we're seven eight years old and think like no, it wasn't a big deal. Well, it's not a big deal to us when we understand the context of everything that's going on or everything that's around that. But if we're that seven or eight year old, like we only have the contextual understanding of what that seven or eight year old has. So something like a next door neighbor, you know, a good friend of yours, somebody who thought you're a good friend telling you that you're worthless or that you're stupid as an adult looking at it, we're like, yeah, no, that's, you know, brush that off. It's no big deal. Like that's not true. But for that eight year old, you don't know that that's not true. And that might plant that seed that continues to manifest as doubt, as lack of belief, as hampered self-esteem for the rest of your life. And these are things that wouldn't, they, they probably wouldn't come up. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a mental health professional, but they probably wouldn't come up in normal talk therapy. I mean, this just speaking from my experience with uh, mental health professionals and counseling and therapy that I've been in, these sort of things probably wouldn't come up. But when you're doing something like RIM that has the ability to get back to those kind of emotional memories and those and those things that are planted, I mean, our bodies, our body's incredibly wise, our unconscious is incredibly wise and the ability for that body and that unconscious to deal with and to release those things and to know exactly where the source of the pain, it's, it's incredible. And only when you have access to a tool like RIM or which is spelled out R-I-M, not R-E-M, but R-I-M, only when we have access to a tool like that can you get to these things. And what it really does is we have we have a, a physical, we have an immune system. So like if we get cut, our body just automatically knows what to do to, to uh, heal that cut. We also have an emotional operating system. In a, and if you think of it in that way, like an emotional immune system, which knows how to deal with any kind of emotional uh, wounds or trauma or baggage or anything that we have, we just need to provide the right place for it. We need to provide that space and that's what's so exciting as a RIM practitioner is having that tool to kind of provide that space. Because when you can dig down and release some of those dark things that are living deep in our body's memory or in our subconscious and in our memory, and you can release some of those things, then it's really exciting what you can do when you do focus on some of those superficial things like changing some habits and changing some thought patterns, then the real transformation can take place.
that was a little bit of an aside, but yes, understanding that how some little benign thing can make transformational differences in somebody's life. It scares the heck out of me whenever I'm thinking like, oh my, like, did somebody say something bad to my daughter on the playground today? Did I say something that she's going to interpret in a different way than what I meant it? It's really scary, but I guess I can rest my head well at night because I know that there's there's tools and there's resources that can help somebody no matter what they experience in their life to uh, get to that place that they want to be. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So two more questions. What area of your business would you like to see better results? So I'd like to see better results with getting... So I've spent a lot of time for the last two years and and umpteen tens of thousands of dollars. I don't really want even to uh, admit it, mix, but developing and designing curriculum. So doing a lot of research, doing a lot of personal training, both as an individual and then as a trainer. And I've invested all that into designing what I believe is the perfect tool, a perfect resource for people that are in a recovery journey. So I've spent a lot of time recently focusing on the creation, the development of that, creating the best user experience, packing it with the most value without making it so long that it's impossible to get through. So a lot of time and energy has gone into that. And now I'm transitioning to the phase of enrolling more people, getting more people involved in it and exposing it to more people. So that's where I'd like to see more results. I mean, I've got this tremendous, this life, you know, this transformational program for people And it hurts me to know that there's people out there tonight that are suffering right now that I know could have fundamental differences or or changes in their life if they were exposed to these certain things. So that's why if I get everybody on the world into it, then I know that I, you know, make an impact on everybody, but at least, you know, hundreds and thousands of people I would like to have involved in this program just so that I can make that shift. Because the beautiful thing is, especially when this kind of ties back to what, what drew me into working with people in addiction recovery, So as I got out of the Marine Corps, I was really inspired to, I mean, like I said, I've been listening to Jim Rohn since I was probably, I don't know, seven, eight years old. Zig Ziglar from even younger than that. My dad used to play Zig Ziglar tapes when I was laying in the crib as an infant. So I kind of always had this thing like, oh, when I get out of the Marine Corps after this career, I want to go out and I just want to help people and share ideas that are inspirational, empowering, motivational. So as I got out of the Marine Corps and tried to kind of find what that path or that journey would look like, I'd started doing some basic talks on leadership, on communication. I wrote two books. One's called The Charity, The Gifts of Giving, where I talk about service and charity and how the, and the benefits that we get in our life and how it can fundamentally improve our life. And then another one just about, about that personal empowerment piece, that moving that locus of control into ourselves so we can experience that difference. But it really wasn't until about two and a half, three years ago that I realized that I want to just focus on people that are in recovery. Because if I could work with you as a coach, as a you know professional coach, life coach or whatever, and I can help your life get a little bit better, okay, that's going to have some net good impact on the world. Like you might slightly improve your relationships, slightly improve your business, your personal health, your whatever that is. But what if I can work with somebody who's in recovery, somebody who's struggled with some of the hardest things that a human can struggle with and survive and, and live through? What if I can help that person really improve their life? Like, what if I can prevent somebody from relapsing or returning to old substances and behaviors? Not only am I going to drastically improve that individual's life, but their family's life, their neighbor's life, their whole community's life. So the net good impact that I can do on the world by taking what I've experienced in my own life, taking the journey that I've been on and sharing that with other people, like now, you know, now that's 10 or a hundred fold greater impact that I can have on the world, on the communities, on lives, on families and everything. So that's, that's really what's kind of drawn my my interest into this and that was answering some question that you asked <laughs> oh yeah so so what would i like to say yeah so i'd like to share that information with more people so i can help transform that that many more lives because i know it's not just the individuals i connect with but it's everybody that's connected to those individuals that will benefit from it powerful now final question garrett what results are you most proud of mm. So a lot of things, I mean, a lot of things I've done in my life. One of the things that I that I always inspire and work with other people in is making a list of some of the greatest successes that we've had in our life. So I've maintained a list. I've got it hanging on my wall over there. of Some of the biggest, you know, the highlights in my last 39 years, I've got to update the list now. But certainly becoming a father was incredible. I mean, one of the most emotional and, and absolutely transformational experiences. You know, you think, Everything that you think is important in your life before that moment till everything after that, I mean, it's it's night and day difference. It's a complete difference. So I'm certainly proud of that and the, the relationship that I have and continue to maintain with my daughter. I'm extremely proud that I served as a United States Marine. So that, you know, when I was 18 years old and graduated from boot camp, that was an incredibly empowering experience in my life. And then the fact that I was able to serve as a pilot in the Marines uh, years later, just incredible. 
and then, you know, publishing books and, you know, and everything kind of down the list. But why that's so important and why I say I, I really encourage people to think about and maintain those lists of things, because when we have successes, and I'm glad that you even brought this up, because when we have successes, we put that on the, like, we just immediately discharge that from our consciousness, right? We don't think about it. And it's perfectly understandable why we do that. If we have a failure, we continue to ruminate over that and everything. And from a survival perspective, it makes sense that we do that, right? Because if we have a failure, if we have a setback, if we have some place where we didn't get the results that we wanted, that could be a potential threat to our safety, our life, our well-being in the future. So our mind is not going to let us forget about that thing because we need to navigate it better the next time around. If it's a success, our mind's like, cool, we did that, let's move on. But we need to consciously bring that awareness back to the successes that we've had because that's the foundation for our self-esteem, our sense of self-worth. Our self-esteem is just an estimate of ourself, of our ability to navigate the challenges that we presently face. So if you're suffering from anxiety, if you're suffering from depression, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel uncertain about the future, if you have a hard time setting goals because you just don't believe they're going to come true, that's because you're not spending enough time thinking about all the awesome things that you've done. I don't care how terrible your life has looked or how many mistakes you've made in the past. You've also done some pretty cool things. You've also had some great number of successes in your life. So if you can take the effort to consciously bring that back into your awareness and think about it, then that's going to uplift your self-esteem and make it much easier for you to experience the successes that you want in your life now and tomorrow. I love it, man. I love, I love the high note there. Uh, so you are listening to resultsleaders.fm. This has been an interview with Mr. Garrett Biss. You can find him on facebook.com, Garrett Biss Fan, LinkedIn, GB Biss, YouTube, Garrett Biss or it's Garrett Bebis. I'll actually share links on the uh, on the page. And the website is totalfreedomchallenge.com. Garrett. Yeah, if anybody goes there too, if anybody is in recovery, knows somebody that's in recovery. So that's and what I'm offering to, you know, to your listeners, because I love the work that you're doing and I love the people that chime in and, and have these kind of conversations. I'm making it's free access to that total freedom challenge. And that's kind of a mini course or an introductory version of some of the deeper work that I do with people. But if you're curious, maybe you want to try something else on, you want to find some new resource, new tools, new approach, then check that out. You can go through it. It's really a mini course. It's five mini lessons that you can go through. And if you're a listener to this podcast, you can have free access to it. Total Freedom Challenge. Garrett, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for sharing your results. And just thank you for everything. Totally enjoyed it, brother. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. This is the podcastfactory.com.